Good afternoon, book lovers. This is Robert Boyd coming at you with another book report. This time we're uh, looking at The Indispensable Composers by Anthony Tomasini. And Tomasini is uh, the chief classical music critic for the New York Times. And uh, that should tell you that it's a very well written book. I mean, I, I zoomed right through it. And he basically is saying, these aren't the greatest composers, but for him, indispensable. But he really is saying these are the greatest composers. Um, he uh, he has a reason for each one of them, but what, what's more important is that he provides like a nice capsule biography of each composer, discusses the music of each composer, and uh, weaves in a lot of personal stories. And uh, the thing about Tomasini is that uh, he studied music um, as a college student and, and as a graduate student and taught it, I think, at Emerson before he became a music critic. Uh, and so there's a lot of personal stories woven in to uh, the narrative for, for these different composers. Now, you, you might have noticed, normally I, I like to start um, a book report with some music, but this time I'm going to try and include the music within the, uh, the report. Yeah, well, he, one of the stories he tells at the beginning is, uh, is how uh, he was uh, in New York City and um, he, he was traveling home, I guess, to Boston, I'm not really sure. And um, he noticed uh, that, that there were tickets for Sweeney Todd, which was uh, uh, just, this was in the late 70s when it was uh, running on, on Broadway. And he was interested in seeing it, even though he was like wearing a, you know, a t-shirt and jeans and not really dressed for a night on the town. But he, he saw someone who was selling really cheap tickets, so he bought some cheap tickets. He goes to the theater. Um, they uh, tell him that uh, there's a space on the fourth row if he wants it, and so of course he takes it. And he ends up sitting uh, right behind uh, John and Yoko, who are taking in the show as well. And uh, and so after after the uh, the musical, uh, the Stephen Sondheim musical, Sweeney Todd. Uh, he walks up to John Lennon and, and says, you know, your music has meant a lot to me. And that's one thing about it is throughout, he's, 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 he's bringing in a, he'll mention that, he'll mention uh, classical pieces that he's seen, performed, etc. But also he'll mention pop music and so on. The kind of things that he liked to listen to personally. And musicals are a part of that. The first composer he talks about, he, he arranges them in um, chronological order. So the first is the earliest, and it's Claudio Monteverde, and um, who lived from 1567 to 1643. And the music we're going to listen to, where which I will start playing now. I'll play it under my voice. Sorry, um, and I, I don't really know how this will turn out, but we'll try it is uh, called Kion Doro, a madrigal. And a madrigal was a, uh, a form in the Renaissance and Baroque period of uh, a song music, and they were secular songs. And so uh, Kion Doro comes from an album called Erotic Madrigal, so I, I have no idea what, what it's about, but assume that it's sexy. Uh, and madrigals usually had six voices singing, so assumed it was sexy with six voices. And it's kind of interesting to imagine. Um, anyway, the reason uh, um, Tomasini is so interested in um, in uh, Claudio Monteverde is because he sees uh, him as having composed the first really good opera. Opera was, you know. A new form back in the uh, you know the the 16th and 17th century, um, and Monteverdi composes an opera called Orfeo, and 
I gotta say, Tomasini is obsessed with opera. He seems like a, a, a total opera queen. Um, although he's not, you know, if, if there's a, a, uh, a quality uh, that sort of defines the, the opera queen, it seems to be like, you know, an obsession with a great divas. And only once does he mention one of the great divas, but uh, at least, you know, once that I, I can recall. So maybe that's an unfair characterization, but he is um, really obsessed with opera and talks, every opera he, he discusses, he gives a detailed recitation of the plot, which, uh, you know, not that interested in opera personally, so I really should have done without that, although, he's a good, like I said, he's a good writer, so because he's a good writer, I could get through his uh, recitation of the plot of Orfeo and many, many other operas, as we'll see. Um, anyway, uh, the next uh, composer is, not surprisingly, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, born in 1685, died in 1750. Uh, Claudia Monteverdi and Johann Sebastian Bach are both, uh, they, they lived a long time for, for their period. Which, as we will see, is not universally the case. Um, the Bach piece I'm going to play, or I am playing now, is uh, uh, the first movement of the Brandenburg Concerto III. Um, anyway, so he, he tells us the biography of Bach, how Bach you know, got his early training, you know, as much as we know. We don't know every detail of his life, but we know most of it. How he's always trying to like wrangle a better job, and I think that uh, you know when I did a uh, a book report on uh, Mozart uh, by Peter Gay, I mentioned that uh, composers used to be um, require you know a job with a um, with a patron who would be like a nobleman of some kind, a count, a duke, a king, um, an elector. Positions that don't really exist anymore, at least not the way they did then. And uh, so he, Bach was always trying to get a better job, a better, better patron. Um, he uh, explains something I've always sort of wondered about, which is the uh, continuo. You always hear that such and such Bach piece or or any Baroque pieces for uh, violins and continuo. And continuo was a um, Really, it was a uh, more than one instrument. Uh, it was a combination of cello, cello or viola da gamba, which is a uh, obsolete instrument, and keyboards, which would, in Bach's time would be harpsichord or organ. And it was it was designed to play the bass line. Um, anyway, this, I mean, there's so much to say about Bach's music, but. I'm going to skip ahead, because otherwise this will go on for hours. Uh, the next composer is uh, George Friedrich Handel, um, from, who lived from uh, 1685 to uh, 1759. Um, actually, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, I guess that is right. So he, he was born the same year as Bach. And he, uh, while, while Bach composed tons of... Uh, religious music because that was well he himself was a very devout man but also that's what he uh, he was hired to do Handel um, ended up immigrating to England um, he had a house there although English law was that foreigners couldn't buy houses so he had to rent a house and he was an ex extremely successful composer and, and of course we're, we're listening to perhaps his most famous uh, piece of music, the Hallelujah Chorus. Um, so, in England, uh, weirdly enough, England didn't really produce any, uh, well, I, I guess maybe it's not weird to people who know classical music, but for whatever reason, England didn't produce any of the, uh, the indispensable composers in this, uh, in this book. Almost all of them come from um, Italy or German-speaking countries except for uh, uh, Debussy, French, and Bartok, Hungarian. Oh, and Chopin, but 
he was Polish, but he moved to France and basically lived the French lifestyle until he died. So Handel uh, lived in this house in London. Uh, uh, you know, he was an extremely successful composer, mostly of uh, operas, because the English loved operas. And I have to say, one thing this book makes clear is that everyone loved operas back in the uh, back in the day. Um, and later he went on to oratorios, which is another kind of storytelling through uh, music, but instead of um, a drama like an opera, it was just like a bunch of songs strung together that uh, that told a story. And Messiah was is is you know is his most famous oratorio, but he wrote a lot of them. So anyway, a little story about the house he lived in. Jimi Hendrix, uh, when he was uh, first getting famous, he had a girlfriend who lived, who rented an apartment in that house. And um, that was basically where Hendrix lived whenever he was back in London, because you know, he was traveling all the time, to, to playing concerts and everything. And he was uh, apparently tickled pink to find out that he was living in Hans's house. And it is interesting to think that, um, I mean, I, I know now that it's kind of impossible to have that kind of coincidence happen. Uh, but, you know, you could get an apartment now at the Chelsea Hotel if you were willing to pay a lot of money. And, uh, but you can't do that in uh, where I live, in Houston, Texas, because our history is just not that long. It's just not that many, there are not that many houses that anyone famous ever lived in that are still standing. Unlike, uh, unlike London, we don't preserve our history at all. And now Handel's house is a Handel Museum, although I, I think they take advantage of the fact that Jimi Hendrix lived there too to sell a few tickets. Uh, anyway, the next composer is uh, the first of the big four from Vienna, uh, Franz Joseph Haydn, who uh, lived from 1732 to 1809. And we're listening to uh, Symphony Number no. 4, uh, the Surprise Symphony. The second movement, uh, the Adante movement. What I like about this is it it's, you know, goes along kind of slowly and then suddenly, bam, these big orchestral chords, and I think that's a surprise in it. Um, Haydn lived almost his entire life as an employee of uh, the Esterhazes, who were a very wealthy, powerful Hungarian family um, uh, nobility. Um, and, you know, he was, he was a coddled servant of the Esterhazes, but he, he was living in the time when it started to become possible to be a freelancer. And I think uh, he, was, um, he was envious of that, that for composers that were making it as freelancers, partly because, you know, they got their music performed in public, which... Uh, working for the Esterhazes, his music was performed for the Esterhazes and their guests. Um, so at some point he, he got a publisher in Vienna to publish his works um, and uh, they subsequently, subsequently were disseminated across Europe and uh, when uh, finally the Esterhazes uh, decided to, to cut back on, on uh, their musical expenses uh, Haydn was retired from that job although he'd, he'd been paid well for a long time so it wasn't he wasn't suffering, so he goes to Vienna to be a um, a freelancer, and he was surprised to see how well known he was because his publishing had been successful. And he was invited to visit London twice, and he was surprised going to London to find when he showed up he was a big celebrity. The people in London loved his music, and that's where he bought, wrote the Surprise Symphony. Um, and Another thing about him, I think I mentioned this in my report on, on Mozart, is that uh, Haydn pretty much invents the string quartet as a genre. Other people had combined two violins, a viola, viola and a, a cello before, but Haydn invented the idea of making a body of music specifically for a string quartet. The next one uh, is uh, a chapter on Mozart, um, 1756 to 1791. Uh, we're listening to uh, 
the symphony number 41, the Jupiter symphony, his last symphony before he died. Obviously, he had a very short life. Um, and I'm not going to say much about this chapter because I feel like I kind of covered Mozart pretty well in, a, in my review of Peter Gay's Mozart. The next uh, of the Vienna Four is a... Uh, I'm not sure why my, my light is flickering like that. Is a uh, Beethoven, of course. Uh, 1770 to 1827. Uh, he didn't live a long time, but he lived much longer than Mozart and much longer than Schubert, who we'll discuss next. What we're listening to is uh, his piano concert number five, uh, The Emperor, uh, his piano concerto, The Emperor concerto, the third movement. And uh, I I'm not going to say tons about the chapter on Beethoven, but Beethoven, uh, he, 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 uh, Tomasini considers Beethoven, and he describes, he, he considers Haydn like the, the greatest string quartet writer, but he doesn't say he's greater than Beethoven. He says, you know, Beethoven's string quartets are great, and he describes the late string quartets as being cosmic. It's like his ultimate, uh, term of praise is like uh, unearthly and I think you know fair enough then the, the next uh, um, composer is Franz Schubert who had an extremely short life from 1792 to uh, 1828 and he he died he he uh, I think he died of syphilis he got syphilis as a young man and um, he, uh, he he lived a uh, Fairly, relatively speaking, a pretty hard scrabble life. Um, he never had like a, a real patron like uh, uh, Haydn did, for example, or really Monteverdi or uh, or Bach. Um, the, what we're listening to is Symphony of Number Eight, the unfinished symphony. Um, he. Tomasini talks about uh, Schubert's operas, except he doesn't really, you know, he doesn't praise them because no one remembers Schubert's operas. They're almost never performed. And uh, Schubert just didn't have access to the really great libra librettist that, uh, that Mozart and, um, and uh, many of the other composers we'll talk about did. And that, that's kind of key is, you know, it's got to be a great drama. So if you have like a really good librettist and you work with them and you have a good sense of drama yourself, as a composer, that, that's, that's pretty key. He does speak about the theory that, that Schubert was gay. And this was a, there's no, there's no uh, you know, hard proof of this. Um, and uh, he, he, he uh, at first, when he first heard it, he was kind of skeptical, but... You know, he didn't dismiss it like a lot of really, well, a lot of fairly conservative uh, music scholars did just because, you know, it seems like a weird thing, uh, you know, 200 years later to, to start talking about who a composer liked to fuck. But, um, but he, Tomasini, as a gay man, he said over time he's, he's decided, you know, I'll accept it, you know, I'm, it, it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility, and uh, Schubert's uh, friends were mostly men, although, you know, Schubert uh, apparently, uh, like a lot of uh, single Viennese men of his day, visited prostitutes, and he got, he got syphilis somehow, uh, but, you know, I don't know, he could have gotten it from a guy, I don't know, anyway, that, that was brought up in, uh, in the book, and it's worth speaking about, but I personally couldn't care less. The next one he talks about is uh, Chopin, Frederick Chopin, another short-lived composer, uh, died of tuberculosis. He was born in 1810 and died in 1849. Um, and what we're listening to is uh, Etude uh, Number 1 in C Major, we're listening to Waterfall. The waterfall etude. Chopin is born in Warsaw and, and gets his first musical training there. 
um, then he moves to, to Paris, and uh, he's, he's, he's a, a kind of a Polish patriot, because Poland is trying to gain this independence from uh, Russia, unsuccessfully. Um, in Paris, he has a, an affair with George Sand, who's uh, the, uh, he's a female writer who takes a, a male um, pseudonym, I'm not sure why wrote many novels. Uh, he was friends with uh, all most of the great composers that passed through Paris at the time, including Franz Liszt, which makes sense because Chopin wrote tons of stuff for piano and Liszt was a, he, he was a, a really good composer and a really great pianist, considered the, the greatest uh, of his time. Um, and, and we'll mention Liszt again, but Liszt is not one of the indispensable composers. The next composer he talks about is Robert Schumann, born in the same year, 1810, died in 1856, another man with a short life and a tragic life. Um, he, uh, his parents didn't want, his father didn't want him to be a musician because, you know, it's a good way to be poor all your life. But, uh, Schumann had a natural talent for it, and he studies piano with a guy named uh, Friedrich Wieck, um, and he falls in love with Wieck's daughter, Clara Schumann, and they, they, uh, in the, you know, back then, to get married, you had to get the permission of the parents, and uh, Wieck did not want his uh, daughter marrying some impoverished musician, and, uh, and so he opposed it, so they ended up having to take Friedrich Wieck to court to, to get, in order to get married. But they did get married, and it was a very happy marriage, by all accounts, and Clara Schumann was a great pianist, and a, a pretty darn good composer as well. And Schumann initially uh, made a living by, um, by writing, he founded a magazine, a music magazine, and writing for it. And, and that's how he, he made a living before his um, uh, musical compositions caught on. And he wrote a lot for piano, as you might imagine. Oh, and we're listening to uh, uh, Noveletten uh, Opus 21 of Robert Schumann. And uh, he had all kinds of problems. He had mental problems. Um, so I, I guess he, he, you know, who can who can uh, diagnose someone's mental problems? Uh, you know, 250 years after the fact. But um, but let's say uh, it, it appeared that he had a manic depression, and in one depressive phase, he attempted suicide by drowning himself in the Rhine. But he was fished out of the, the, oh, let me add here. He was close friends with the young Brahms. And when Brahms showed up and played him some early works, uh, Schumann praised the, the living daylights out of him in his magazine. So he, he, commit, he tries to commit suicide, he's fished out of the Rhine, locked up in a mental hospital, and his, uh, his physicians, uh, for some reason, thought that it would be uh, improper to, to let Clara visit him, that that would make his condition worse, which seems unnecessarily cruel. And uh, apparently Clara was deeply upset by it. But Brahms visited him almost, uh, like, like very regularly, weekly. Um, and right before he died, they allowed Clara one last visit. And, um, and so, uh, Clara visits him, and then almost immediately he dies. And Clara survived him by 40 years. So she was around for almost the entirety of the 19th century playing piano, and she made a specialty of playing his pieces, as you might expect. So now we're going to get into heavy opera. Um, Giuseppe Verdi, uh, he, he had a, a nice long life. Born in 1813, so just a couple of years after Chopin and Schumann, but died in 1901. And we're listening to uh, 
one of his most famous arias, La Donna and Mobili, uh, from Rigoletto, i.e. Women are Fickle. Um, it's sung by the Duke, who's a villain in Rigoletto, by the way. Uh, he, um, naturally, Tomasini tells us the plots of a ton of Verdi operas in excruciating detail. And I don't really know that much about Verdi, but it was interesting to see that he was a, um, a big supporter of Italian unification. And uh, his chorus from his opera from uh, Nabucco called uh, Va Pensiero was uh, sung by the, the was sung by captive Hebrews in the uh, opera Nabucco, and it became an anthem of the Risorgimento, the uh, the unification movement. And after the unification movement was successful, uh, Verdi was elected. Uh, to whatever legislative office he was uh, qualified for, and he really didn't want to be a politician, but he'd been, you know, supporting this uh, movement so long that he took the job as a great honor. So, I mean, some of his authors are uh, Otello, Falstaff, Aida, and uh, he has a kind of interesting anecdote about Aida, about uh, he, he says uh, the, the the great Aida uh, uh, Devo was a uh, Leontine Price, and uh, he saw her in like I don't know. He saw one of her performances as Aida, and it's and then he writes, and I'm going to read this. In 2000, I accompanied Price on a visit to a group of school children in Harlem where she read a storybook version of Aida she had written and in surprise sang before an assembly. She, she must have been pretty old by then, but afterwards she took some questions. One youngster asked why Aida was her favorite role. Price answered, quote, when I sang Aida, I used the most important plus I have. You have it, I have it, this beautiful skin. When I sang Aida, my skin was my costume. And Aida is a, uh, in the opera, is a, an Ethiopian slave who's been captured by the, um, the uh, Egyptians and ends up, it's a, of course a love story that Aida is the protagonist of. So, enough of Verdi. We're going to get into uh, uh, another opera <laughs> uh, composer. Uh, almost a contemporary of uh, Verdi, uh, Richard Wagner, from 1813 to 1883, he lived. And uh, we're listening to uh, probably his most well known piece, uh, uh, The Rite of the Valkyrie, um, also known as Hoyo to Toho, which is uh, Brunhilde's war cry, which she sings. Um, it's, it's a weird war cry. I don't think it means anything. Just good syllables. And probably fun to sing. Uh, he starts off, he does talk about Wagner's anti-Semitism. And it's, it's, it's nasty. Um, he wrote a, 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 a lengthy essay about how Jews couldn't make music. Called Judaism and Music. And he, uh, he basically says, you know, people like Mendelssohn were bad. Um, and, uh, you know, Hitler, of course, loved him for it. So, uh, Wagner wanted to, um, wanted a place for his operas that it would sound like he, he imagined it. He had, you know, a very strict idea of what it, an opera should sound like, what the, the story, uh, uh, should be, the libretto, he wrote his own librettos. What the scenery should be and the idea of the visual aspect of it. And uh, so he's, he's, um, he has a patron, uh, King Ludwig, um, who's a, you know, kind of an oddball, but loves Wagner's music. And it, he, he builds a, uh, an opera house at uh, Bayreuth for uh, 
lying there in Bavaria, and um, and that it's still there, and they still perform uh, uh, Wagner productions, and uh, Hitler loved going to Beirut, Beirut, and uh, so I'm showing a picture of Hitler at, at Beirut, and he's wearing his his uh, evening clothes because that's what you wear for the opera. Um, and the weird thing is, you know, Hitler made it sort of a like a religion. You had to like Wagner if you were a good Nazi. But the problem with Hitler was that uh, a lot of the people who liked opera in Germany were Jews. So when he basically made it impossible for them to go see an opera, certainly at Beirut, um, the uh, subscriptions declined precipitously. And so Hitler had, uh, you know, the Nazi party buy up all the seats and required his guys to fill the seats. Um, I told you I, I'd get back to Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt's daughter was Cosima Liszt. And uh, she, uh, she was married to uh, a, a famous conductor in Wagner's time named Hans von Bülow. And when uh, she met uh, Wagner, Wagner fell in love with her and they started an affair. And uh, he, he, um, she even had you know, Wagner's child while married to Von Bülow. Von Bülow was such a wimp that he basically said, okay, well, I'll raise, raise this kid as my child. Uh, and he conducted some of Wagner's operas uh, at Bayreuth. And um, she was an, even more of an anti-Semite than, than Wagner. Um, Tomasini makes it clear that Wagner's anti-Semitism wasn't, you know, down to the bone. It wasn't like this sort of medieval anti-Semitism. It came out of like a, a um, quasi-political stance, but that seems really far-fetched. But Kazima had kind of the classic medieval anti-Semitism. And uh, anyway, she seems like a terrible person, and he was too. Uh, next, we go to Johannes Brahms, uh, 1833 to 1897. Uh, we're going to listen to a little bit of a, a German requiem, um, which uh, Brahms wanted to do a requiem. Uh, requiems are usually um, uh, about, uh, you know, about honoring the dead, but in this case Brahms made it more about mourning the dead and he wanted it to have no trace of uh, Christian dogma in it, which is kind of unusual because all requiems are usually very Christian. Um, he was a friend of Schumann. Schumann was a big promoter of his early talent and remained a friend of Clara Schumann uh, the rest of her life. Or, I guess, yeah. He, he lived a few years longer than uh, Clara. Um, he never got married, um, but he seems to have been he satisfied that side of his life with uh, the many hookers of, uh, of Vienna. Um, there was a kind of a, a contest between Brahms and Wagner, whether you are a Brahmsian or a Wagnerian composer. I don't know if Brahms really ever participated in that. I mean, he, he he was willing to say nice things about Wagner after Wagner died, but uh, anyway, that, that's that's Brahms. The next chapter is Claude Debussy, uh, 1862 to 1918. Uh, and uh, one thing, I you know, I've been showing photos of each composer as we talk about them, and as as we get closer in time to now. We have more photographs. We had, we just had like drawings and paintings of, you know, colonial Monteverdi and Mozart and so on. But Brahms and WC we have photos of. Um, we're listening to uh, the prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn. And one thing that's interesting about um, WC is uh, he, while with all these other composers, they're like intellectual 
equals for other composers. You know, Brahms uh, Brahms was friends with Schumann. Uh, uh, Chopin was friends with Franz Liszt, etc. And, and that's the way it is. Debussy was friends with Eric Satie and so on. But Debussy was also really involved with uh, the literary movements of his time. And uh, so this this music, Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn, is from is inspired by a poem by Stefan uh, Mallarmé, um, who uh, wrote uh, Afternoon of the Fawn, uh, La Pre Midi d'une Fawn, I guess, and uh, and W. C. hired or uh, engaged one of uh, uh, Mallarmé's uh, contemporaries, Maurice Metterlink. Uh, who wrote a play called Peleus and, and Melisande, and uh, he turned it into an opera, which of course Tomasini talks about endlessly. Um, but he makes a, a good point, which is that, uh, you know, even though Maeterlinck won the Nobel Prize in 1911, who reads Maeterlinck today? I, I certainly have never read anything by him. He's like best known for having written this play that W.C. turned into an opera. Um, so, W.C.'s music was called Impressionism mainly because that was in the air uh, during W.C.'s life. Um, and, and the idea was, uh, you know, perhaps you would get an impression from his, his, his music of, of a thing that he's writing about. But, um, Tomasini mentions that uh, uh, La Mer, uh, which is uh, perhaps Debussy's most well-known uh, big orchestral work, sounds best if you stop thinking about the ocean when you're re listening to it. It sounds best if you think of it as an orchestral object. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure if I totally agree with that, but... It's, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't sound like the ocean. It sounds like a bunch of violins and timpanis and woodwinds, etc. I, I think uh, that the idea that you could uh, make people think of, you know, it doesn't have, music just doesn't have that connection to the real world that literature or visual art does. Um, except in, you know, operas where they tell stories, which might be partly why Thomasini is so enamored with the operas. And speaking of operas and being enamored of them, a uh, composer that seems kind of out of place, uh, all, so far every one of these composers has pushed um, musical expression further by, you know, Thomasini gives you a little bit of music theory and uh, and admittedly, most of that's over my head. But um, but the next one uh, didn't really push it any further. Uh, Giacomo Puccini, uh, 1858 to 1924. So he's the first 20th century composer. And we're listening to uh, Nessun Dorma from uh, his opera Turandot. And when he, he, he relates that when... Puccini died in 1924, his estate was worth, in today's dollars, over 200 million. So, it used to be possible to get rich being a, a opera composer. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of his, his best known operas are like Turandot, Madame Butterfly, Tosca, La Boheme, and I, I want to say a little something about Boheme. Um, when I was a kid, I grew up on a street called Beauregard, named after the uh, the uh, Confederate general. Um, it, it's it should be changed, I I admit, but while I was there, it was called Beauregard. Anyway, the next street over was called Rip Van Winkle for some reason, and then the next street over from that was called Boheme, except we pronounced it Bohem because you know we didn't know any better. No one knew any better. Everyone pronounced it Bohemian. People who lived on it pronounced it Bohemian. 
And, you know, the street signs, they didn't have an accent over the, the, the first E. But it, it's actually a continuation of a street from a, a neighborhood in uh, Houston where the developer decided to call, name all the streets after um, operas. So there's a Tosca and, um, and, and there's some other uh, opera names. Like, um, but anyway, Bohem. <laughs> it was a, a street that I, I grew up near. Anyway, like I said, publishing was how uh, these guys would make some money as freelancers. And by the time uh, Puccini came along, there were no noble patrons anymore. And so he, he made a very lucrative publishing agreement and made money hand over fist from it. Um, that's really how a composer made money prior to uh, the recording industry. Which, uh, and really, if you study uh, music, musical history in the, in the U.S., that's, you know, people uh, made a lot of money from publishing before, uh, before, you know, RCA and, and Columbia and all those record companies were formed. Um, anyway, so he does talk about interviewing Jonathan Larson, who was the composer of Rent. And Rent was uh, meant to be a rock opera updating of La Boheme, uh, which I didn't know. And he, he, he talked to Jonathan Larson the same year that Jonathan Larson died of an aortic dissection. Uh, this is tragic. Anyway, then we get into uh, 20th century composers. He first talks about uh, Arnold Schoenberg, who lived from 1874 to 1951. And we're listening to uh, Madonna from uh, Piero Lunaire. Schoenberg, uh, he, he was also a music theorist hardcore, and he, he, he saw uh, the history of music as going away from tone. And tone is like, um, you know, uh, when, when, a mu when music is in a certain key, all the notes sound right together, and when I say sound right, I don't even know what that means, except that they sound right to my Western ears. Um, and he decided that atonal music, although he hated the term atonal, was uh, really where music was progressing to. And Tomasini just does not follow with that, the idea that musical progresses towards a certain thing. Um, but that was what Schoenberg uh, believed, and uh, he, so he came up with the idea of 12-tone music, where instead of uh, playing just the, uh, the the notes in the key that you're in, uh, you would write music that, that played all 12 notes um, of an octave uh, with it before starting over again. And uh, it, it doesn't lead to very memorable... Um, Tunes, singable tunes. There's no Nissan Dormas in 12 tone music. There's definitely no uh, La Donna in Mobile. Uh, certainly no Brandenburg concertos. Uh, but, you know, this, this theory of uh, 12 tone music really took hold uh, in his lifetime, especially in post war music. Um, Piero Piero Lumaire was composed in, uh, and I'm going to guess on this pronunciation, in something called Sprechtima, which uh, means speech song. And part of the reason it was composed this way is because the person he composed it for was not an opera singer or, you know, a trained singer. Um, she was a cabaret singer, and so he wanted something that was, someone who wasn't an opera singer could be capable of singing. But he, he liked that, so he used it over and over again. Um, like a lot of composers, uh, like the last three composers we'll talk about, he was forced to uh, flee uh, Germany because of the Nazis and ended up living in uh, L.A. for uh, the last few years of his life. And he was friends with uh, Gershwin, George Gershwin, of all people, a completely tonal composer. 
And they, they were tennis buddies. They would play tennis together, which was a fact that I found charming. The next uh, um, 20th century composer he talks about is uh, Igor Stravinsky. And we're listening uh, to uh, the Augurs of Spring, uh, which is a... Uh, from uh, the Rite of Spring, and this is the, the dance of uh, the adolescent girls. He tells the, the story of, the, the famous story of the riot at the uh, premiere of the, the, the Rite of Spring. I've heard that that's kind of a exaggerated myth, so I don't know whether I totally believe his story, but you know, I think, it's, I think he knows what he's talking about at least. Uh, so I think maybe it's less than a riot, but Perhaps people booing? I don't know. I don't know if fist fights actually broke out in the audience. Um, Stravinsky wrote a bunch of ballets in the early 20th century. Um, the Firebird, Petrushka, The Rite of Spring for uh, uh, Diaghilev, um, a uh, impresario who ran the Ballet Russes, which was a ballet troupe that performed all over the world. Um, they're based in, in Paris, but they were basically, you know, the, the thing was that they were Russian. And um, they actually performed in Houston once, I, I've read, amazingly to, to imagine. And the thing that bugged people so much about uh, The Rite of Spring was, uh, which I think you can tell by this, this music that we're listening to, is the complex time signatures. They were really hard for musicians to play because, you know, he kept changing time signatures within uh, within that that particular movement. So I don't know. It sounds sounds tough. But he did leave France and move to the USA ahead of Hitler. Um, he uh, he taught in the USA, but ended up in LA. But weirdly enough, it seems like he and Schoenberg uh, never met um, while they were living in LA. Um, at the end of his life, uh, Stravinsky started composing twelve tone music. I think because uh, his, uh, his his assistants were telling him this is the thing, this is what people do now. And uh, Thomas Schumann does describe hearing the very elderly Stravinsky conduct in 1971, the same year Stravinsky died. And the last composer is kind of the least known of the three big. Uh, 20th century modernist composers, Bela Bartok from Hungary. He lived from 1881 to 1945. And what we're listening to is a music for strings, percussion, and celesta, uh, fourth music, the Allegro Molto mu uh, movement. A uh, celesta is a kind of a piano. Uh, Bartok had a deep uh, interest in and stud and compiled a, 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 a very scholarly study of folk songs. And when I say he studied folk songs, he didn't read about them. He went out and, and encountered the folk and recorded them on a very uh, primitive uh, um, phonograph re recorder. So he seems like a, uh, a Hungarian uh, John Lomax slash Alan Lomax uh, instead, instead of recording a prisoner singing blues songs, uh, he's recording uh, folk singing folk songs. And he incorporated that into his music. Um, he did one opera, um, Bluebeard's Castle, which is really a one-act opera, and I saw it, and it's, it's good, and apparently it was highly influenced by W.C. Uh, mostly what I know him for are his uh, piano pieces. He did a ton of piano pieces. Um, and um, he uh, he was an anti-fascist, and uh, of course Hungary was became a fascist country and has become a fascist country again, tragically. And uh, he, after Hitler came to power in Germany, he refused to let his music be performed there. And then, of course, when Hungary allied itself with the Nazis, he had to he had to flee and immigrated to the U.S. in 1940 and only lived five more years 
and he died kind of poor. He, he was no Puccini. He only had ten thousand dollars in assets when he died. Um, he wrote a lot of pieces for uh, students, including one called Ten Easy Pieces, which makes me think of the, the Jack Nicholson movie, movie. Five Easy Pieces. Anyway, here's uh, something that uh, that Tomasini wrote about his uh, his music for students. Um, his most systematic contribution to music education was Microcosmos, a six-volume series of 153 progressively challenging piano pieces. The first volume, beginning with uh, unison melodies, introduces students to repetitions, syncopations, canons, the Dorian mode, and much more. With each book, the musical substance of the pieces becomes more sophisticated, along with the technical challenges. Um, even today, every home where children study piano, Bartok is part of the family conversation. What could be a greater legacy? What indeed? In the uh, epilogue, he talks about um, this thing that happened after World War II, uh, where serialism, which is uh, what 12-tone theory evolved into, versus tonality was, how there were composers on one side that were composing uh, with, uh, you know, ordinary keys and so on, and composers on the other side who were composing uh, serialist work, and, and the more extreme serialists didn't just not just didn't, didn't just want the, the 12 notes but also wanted to like have a certain random quality to the, the rhythm and so on and those works well they're, they're interesting to hear but they're hard they're hard to hear and hard to play so that was a big deal for a long time and you know in the, I guess in the college uh, composition, classes, you know, you had to pick a side. Um, but uh, that fight has faded away. Uh, partly because there was a, a, a postmodern, what he describes as a, a postmodern backlash against serialism, which started with minimalism, which is very tonal. Um, not exactly hummable, but it's not like, it doesn't feel random. It feels like, you know, everything makes sense. The notes make sense. Uh, the, the the fight between serialism and, and tonal composing has pretty much ended. And that's pretty much the end of the book. Anyway, uh, thanks very much.